Love you. Yeah. I'm actually very surprised that you're still here. <laughs> I I told Mr. Lim earlier today that um, earlier this evening that um, by the time uh, it's tea break, most of you would have gone home, and then I have a very small intimate uh, crowd to speak to. But congratulations on your staying power. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, now, um, when Father Anthony uh, invited me to give a little talk um, about how to keep children in faith, um, I decided to pick this title. Now, why this title? Okay. Um, throughout this evening, um, you will hear me tell stories, lots of stories, and I, I hope that you find uh, some of these stories meaningful. Okay, first story. Why this title? I have a very good friend, a lovely lady with two children, and uh, she adores her children. She has, she does everything she can for them. She feeds them well. She gives them a good education. She takes them on holidays. And every time I meet her, she does something new for her children. She opens a savings account for them, right? And the list goes on, you know. Um, and now she's thinking about endowment funds, so that by the time they are 21, they will have something. And one day when we were talking, and uh, she said, I do all this because I will not be around all the time. And when I leave, I want to leave them something good. What occurred to me was, what's the best gift for our children? when we are not around. And I told her, I said, this is all, these are all material things. Perhaps, and for me, in all certainty, the best gift you can give to your children is faith. The love of God, the knowledge that He will stand by them, with them, through everything that they have to go through in life. And so, it is the legacy that we have to think about when we want to leave and have something to give to the children. That's the most important thing. All right? Now, the more precious the present, okay, the more effort I think we have to put into it. Right? Okay? So, we have to put a lot of effort if we want to do the right thing. And, and leave something behind for our children. Now, in order to leave something behind for your children, first of all, you must know what it is. So if you want to leave behind the love of God for our children, knowing God, first of all, we too have to know God. And we have to know what we believe in. Now, the Catholic faith is a beautiful faith. Do you agree with me? Yes. Alright, it's a beautiful faith. Alright, we have the Universal Mass wherever. I just came back from abroad and I was able to attend Mass every day when I was abroad. You know, and it's exactly the same. And you know, throughout the world, the churches have the same Mass. Alright, we have our Catholic traditions, we have our symbols, we have all the lovely churches in the world. And we have the lovely paintings. So tonight I'm using paintings. Paintings to help tell uh, some of the stories uh, that I have. Alright, we'll start with the first one. This is a very beautiful painting. You may have seen it before. It is by Michelangelo. Alright? And um, you see, if you go to uh, Florence, um, in Italy, you will see it there. All right, it's a beautiful painting of the Holy Family, quite unlike the usual pictures we have of the Holy Family. Um, you see the little boy in the middle at the back, on, on the right-hand side. That's St. John the Baptist. Okay? And um, there is that line. St. John the Baptist actually is in a pool of water there. All right? And behind is the time of the pagans. And in front you have Christianity. Okay, so uh, St. John the Baptist is the cutting point. Alright, so it's a beautiful picture and it's very inspiring. Here you see 
the Holy Family, very intent, very focused on themselves. And you see Joseph passing baby Jesus to Mary. Alright? It's all done with a lot of care, ensuring that he doesn't fall, he doesn't drop. Alright? And she she is also very focused on picking him up, making sure he's secure. Okay? So that's a beautiful picture. Alright? Now why do I show this picture? Because I think one of the best things we give to our children is love. Alright? And it's very, very important that we give and give that environment of security, love to our children. It is true, our love for the children, that they will experience the love of God. If children will not understand the meaning of love if someone doesn't show it first. And the first experience of love always comes from the family. Alright, so you, you see, and it's never too early to start loving or showing love and expressions of love for the children. Okay, let me tell you another story. So, there's this lady, alright, acting mother uh, of twins. And when she found that she had twins, okay, she grew very big. And every night when she said prayers, she would tell the children, I love you a lot, I love the both of you a lot, and Jesus loves you too. And when she goes to church, all right, she uh, receives the Eucharist, she goes up to the priest and says, please bless the big box in front of me. <laughs> okay, and the priest would bless and say a prayer aloud, all right. Apparently, babies in the womb can hear Right? You hear our parents playing Mozart to babies. So this mother talks to her babies and tells the babies every day that Jesus loves them. Well, they are now 18 months old, a beautiful pair of boys. Okay? So it's never too early to start. I would like to talk about another um, scene that I've seen. Here in your own church, in Blessed Sacrament. I have observed a mother. After Mass, she brings her little toddler, small little girl, okay, and they will walk to the center, the mother would bow at the tabernacle, and then the little girl would sometimes be looking around, and then with some encouragement, the little girl would bow, and then they walk on, and then they go to the picture of Our Lady. And the mother would whisper to the little girl, and they would both, both do a, a very quick bow. And I think the mother teaches the little girl to say a prayer, and then they go off. That is a real picture of holiness. A beautiful start to teaching children to love God, teaching children about His presence in church. Okay, and that Jesus is always there for us. So I think these children that I've mentioned have a head start in life because the parents have role modeled, okay, that love for God. Okay, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to open my notes and make sure that I give you more stories. Um, still a bit um, blur for my trip, I just came back from abroad. So. All right, two stories, right? Or three stories already. Okay, let's keep counting. Okay, and it's important for us um, to have a sense of family. Now today, we have many parents who travel abroad. And, and, and so the sense of family is not always there, right? So I see amongst us a lot of grandparents, I think, who uh, have aunties and uncles as well. And we then can help form that family and to be there for the children. The family is where the child first learns the language of love. And it is very important that they hear the words of love. They hear how valuable and precious they are. 
and these are very, very important. Now, besides that, the next thing that perhaps very important too is the forming of the habit of prayerfulness. Okay? So here we talk about integrating God's presence. Now, I have to share a personal story with you. When I was very young, my parents would bring us to the seaside almost every night. And I stayed in, in the Katong area. So the seaside is where Parkway Parade is now, okay, before the Reformation. And we would have to walk. And we usually pass the Church of the Holy Family. Now before we go to the seaside, we'll stop at the, at the church. And if you know the old uh, Holy Family, there was a grotto just outside the gate. And each of us would be given a coin. And we put the coin in take a candle and then uh, light the candle and say a little prayer. As children, to tell you the truth, the lighting of the candle was the most fun. More fun than saying the prayers. But it was formation of habit. Okay? And we would each light the candle and um, my parents would say, or my mom would say, I said a prayer for you today uh, that you would do your spelling well. Or my, my dad would say something like, uh, I thank God for something, you know. Or my mom would say, oh, I said a prayer for you today that your nose didn't bleed for a week. I was always having nose bleed. So, so we learn. We learn through how our parents said prayers, to say our prayers, right? There's another family I know, four children. And every night they say the night prayers before going to bed. They have a system of taking turns to lead the prayers. So all the children lead the prayer, but the little one cannot lead in prayer because he's only in kindergarten. He didn't know how to lead prayers. But he had a very important job to do. You know what was his job? At the end of all the prayers, he is the one who will have to say, Amen. <laughs> and if he doesn't say Amen, the prayer session doesn't end. The little one felt so important, right? So we should think about, so my story, I'll just tell the stories and you have to make sense of it yourself, okay? Right, so these are some of the things that happen. I'm so glad that Mr. Lim spoke about school and environment. I was going to say a whole lot, but I think I can cut it very, very short because he has said quite um, a bit in terms of substance, you know, and how school actually helped to fall. For young parents here, I'm going to do an advertisement. Please do send your children to Catholic schools. Okay? I was principal of a Catholic school for a while. And I can tell you that it does make a great difference. I came from a Catholic school myself, like Mr. Lim. Okay? And I think we have done well. You know, we don't have to go to top schools in Singapore. Catholic schools will bring our children up to be good children, good daughters and sons, good wives and husbands, and very loving people. So that's a good advertisement. Okay? But it really, really does help because it, it integrates the habit of prayer throughout the day in school. We start morning with prayer. You know the greatest privilege of being a principal of Catholic school is to be able to stand in prayer every morning with a thousand children in front of you and lead them in prayer. And that was my greatest privilege. Nothing else actually was so important as that. And I, every morning when I stood in front of the school, I thank God for giving me a Catholic school to run. Right? So, I think if you, if you have um, to make a choice, it doesn't mean tomorrow all of you will change school. Huh? <laughs> okay? If your children are in primary 5, you don't change their schools because primary 5 to primary 6 is a very important uh, two-year course. Right? But if you have but children registering for school, you may want to consider a good Catholic school. All Catholic schools will give your children that foundation of faith. All right. Okay. Then we we move on to the next picture. Now, this picture.
picture, I, I think most of us are Catholics here, so you, you know what the picture depicts. Finding Jesus in the temple. Okay? Alright. Mary and Joseph took Jesus uh, to the feast of the Passover, and um, on their way back, they suddenly realized he was not with them. Okay? And so you see those two pictures. Um, interestingly, both the, the artists here are British artists, okay, from Britain. And um, one of them hangs in the British Museum, the Birmingham Museum, okay? Right, now we look at the first picture on the left. Here you see Jesus, okay, in deep conversation uh, with the rabbis or the doctors of the temple, okay, and um, he's so intent that he does not realize his parents have come. They are right at the back in the picture. Okay, if you look closely, they are there at the back of the picture. Now, they found him to be very, um, they were very amazed by him, by his maturity, by his knowledge of the religion. So Mary and Joseph must have done a very good job of giving him that knowledge. So formation of faith. Now, in the first picture that I showed you, I talked about love. All right. In this second picture, is about the head knowledge. All right. You you start with the heart always because um, children who are very young don't have the head knowledge yet. So you start with the heart, and then you go to the head. The head knowledge is very important um, as part of formation. And you hear about Mr. Lim's story, how over the years his knowledge was formed of the religion. Each of us have a part to play in forming that knowledge of religion for our children. And it's very important. It's very important especially today. The world is quite a confused world. Right? Our children have to grapple with worldly values as opposed to godly values. And they have to learn to stand up, stand up for their faith they have to learn to defend their faith. You cannot defend your faith in a vacuum. You need knowledge. You need grounding in your, in your faith. You, know, you need to appreciate what the Catholic religion is. If you do not have that, you cannot defend your faith. So we have to equip our children with the knowledge so that they can stand up and speak up for themselves, speak up for what they stand for, speak up for the church. So that is very important. All right? Now in the other picture, in the other picture, you see Mary coming up to Jesus and saying, you know, why do you do this to us? Your father and I, and be so anxious about you. And Jesus replies, You know, don't you know? I'm, up. I'm here to do my father's business. Alright, so, was he being rude? What do you think? Right, many of you have teenage children. Some of you have teenage children. And you will have come across a situation like that. Sometimes it hurts, and when it hurts, it's usually our ego that's hurt, correct? Okay, don't use that tone with me, how dare you, right? Because we get hurt, but if we are a bit more open and we continue to be loving parents, it may not be actually a sign of disrespect. It could be a child just simply stating what he's very focused on and not realizing that what he says can actually be hurting. So sometimes we have to put our egos aside a little bit. Mary did that. What did she say? What, did, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that she took all that in and she, and she kept it in her heart. So sometimes that silence and that meditation or reflection on what's happening is more powerful than speaking up 
you know, and, 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 and giving the child a scolding. So you've got to think about these things. Every passage in the Bible was put there inspired by God. Okay, this is the only passage in the Bible about Jesus as a teenager. Right, so a very powerful thing because it shows you that Mary and Joseph did not have an easy time with a teenager. But she was silent and the Bible doesn't continue to tell us more. But they must have spoken about it because Jesus then went home and he was obedient. Okay, and the next time we hear about it, well, he would have grown to, you know, to adulthood. So, so there is much to look at in these pictures. And, and they, they do tell us a lot of stories. Okay, let me see what else I can tell you about this, the stories here. Okay, so it is very important for us um, to ground our children well. And the trouble is, we are not going to know all the answers. You agree? Right? One boy went home from, sc from school one day, uh, from Sunday school one day, and then he said to his mother, he said, if God is so loving, so kind, why did he send his son to suffer? Why, was, why is there such a bloody scene in the Bible? And the mother was amazed because that boy was about 10 years old. And it's a very good question. And we have to help our children find the answers. And we can only help them find the answers if we are willing to find the answers ourselves. So we have to grow in our own faith and deepen our own faith. Only then can we give that to the children. Okay? And it is okay to say, I do not know. Let's go and find out. And that's when you go and see Father Anthony. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I can't do, I, I can't give answers today. I told Father Anthony, I said, this talk that you want me to give is such a challenge because I can speak one whole day on this topic. It's such a huge topic and so deep. Okay, and I got so many stories from school that I want to share. But half an hour is all he has given me. And I have to sit down after half an hour so that you can go home. Alright? So there is, there, is, there is so many things that we have uh, that we can talk about. Okay, so um, I read this from a book, so I'm going to read this to you. It says, parenting teens, that means parenting teenagers, must be done in God's strength and not our own. Teenagers are very difficult, all right? And it has to be done in God's strength, not our own. Otherwise, we will just be caught up in a will versus willpower situation between us and the children, and everyone will lose, okay? So we have, we do not have all the answers, but God has. And then he will answer and help to make things right. Okay? And Jesus has promised he will be here with us until the end of time. So we need to sometimes let go, trust in God, and just be prayerful at situations where we can't do much. Okay? And the other thing is that I think we have to be consistent. Now, I see grandparents, and I, I think there will be aunties and uncles here and so forth. We have to be consistent. We have to agree on certain values and carry forward. Okay? Um, it is very sad when parents break up and father says, this is the way, and mother says, this is the way. The child gets totally confused. And we have lots of confused children in school today because parents cannot agree. Okay? So we have to agree, set standards, there are some, some non-negotiables, going to church on Sunday is not negotiable. They, of course, unless the child is very sick or something. But I think you understand what I'm saying, right? You, you can't have a, uh, something like, 
you have to go to church every Sunday except during the exams. Then you have to study. Then there are parents who do that. And so the child gets confused. So is God important? My exams more important? It becomes difficult on children. Right? Parents take leave um, for various reasons. But you, you, you do not hear of many parents taking leave to join a church camp with a son or daughter. So if you take leave to go shopping, but you, you will not take leave to go church camp with your daughter, you are sending signals, right? And then when the signals are wrong, then you, 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 you cannot then deepen that faith of the child. Because they are, you are sending contradictory messages to the children, right? Okay, I think I have to move on, although there's so many other stories here, because um, it's getting a bit late. Okay. Um, huh, this one. This one is very interesting. The return of the prodigal son. Okay, we all know the story, right? Okay? The boy takes his, his, tells his father, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go, give me my wealth, and I will do well on my own. Okay? He makes a mess of life, and he comes back. Okay? Our children will also leave. They will, they, they, they will leave. But by the time they leave, you know, what does it mean by giving that wealth to them? You know, the, the father gives the wealth, part of the wealth to that child. For, for me, it means, okay, the grounding that we have, we have given him, the values that we have given him. And with that, hopefully, he's able to survive the world on his own. It's not just the material wealth that you give to him. Right? So the, the previous slide of faith formation is very important. Okay, before they leave you, let's hope that they already have that value, the, that, the right values to take with them so that they will survive wherever they are. Now here I'm going to tell you some stories, and they are good stories. To me, they are good stories. Okay, the first one is um, the search. Give me a moment, huh? Okay, the, I, I'm going to change some stories because it's getting a bit late. The first one to, 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 to start off with first, perhaps, is to allowing a child to make mistakes. Okay? If you give him his freedom, you must also give him the freedom to make mistakes and to know that you are there to support him or her. Now, I'm going to share this story with you about a boy in my school. He, he had done something grievously wrong, grievously wrong in school, and had hurt another, another child quite badly. He, he came to the office and he said, I am so sorry, I know I have done something very, very, very wrong. Okay? And I told him, I'm very proud of you for saying that. Okay? Because if you can say that, it means you know what is right and what is wrong. And then we can move on from here. Then we call in the parents. Because the parents have to know. Because another child has been involved, right? We call in the parents. And the mother said, my son never does anything wrong. He is a good boy and nothing ever is wrong when it comes to my son. Okay, and that went on for three hours. Three hours, okay? And the boy stood there, totally exhausted by his parents, I think, okay? And the father, remember I said, united front, father and mother must have the same. The father was, I think in his heart, agreeing with what the school was saying. 
And then he looks at his wife, and I think he said, Oh no, I'm going to get hell when I go home. <laughs> and so he's trying to cite her a little bit. And after that, he tried to cite the school a little bit. And he didn't know where he was going. You know? And that took three hours before we eventually sent them home. And so it, it was settled. It was settled. And I felt very sad for the boy. Because if he's not allowed to make mistakes, how is he going to grow? Right? And the next morning, I found him standing outside my office waiting for me at 7 o'clock in the morning. And, I, and, and the first thing that came to my head was, Oh gosh, his mother has told him to come and say that he didn't do anything wrong. And, and, and I told her, calm down, don't say anything, just say hi. So I said, hi. <laughs> then I, and he looked at me and then I said, you're very early. And he looked at me and he said, you want to speak to me? He said, yeah. And then he said, I'm so sorry that my mother gave you such a hard time yesterday. <laughs> Eleven-year-old boy. You know, I want to say yes. Your mother was horrible. <laughs> but principal of schools cannot say things like that. <laughs> so I looked at him and said, "It's because your mother loves you a lot, and sometimes in loving you, they don't always do quite the right thing." Got to save the mother's face, right? Yeah. And then I looked at him and I said, but I think you will grow up to be a fine gentleman. You know? And I think God will love you. God loves you a lot. And I think you will grow up to be a good person. A very, very good person. And I looked at him and I said, hmm, you're very handsome too. <laughs> the more, you know? And he just straightened up and he said, have a nice day. <laughs> right. We need to let our children make mistakes. And we need to acknowledge their mistakes so that they can grow from strength to strength. We cannot deny them that. Alright? Okay, one more story. What else? Let me choose another good one. Ah, this one. Must tell. We must... Okay, so that one was about making mistakes, right? This one. Trusting in God's love and faithfulness. Another friend. I've got lots of friends, huh? I've got lots of stories about them. Uh, luckily, they're all not copyrighted. Uh, this lady sent her daughter abroad to study in the university. A very good girl. Very well brought up, very kind, very holy, good girl. First year was fine. We are all so proud of her. She did very well in the first year university exams. Into the second half of year two, her mother came and told us that her boyfriend had moved in to live with her and he was a drug addict. All right? When she skyped with her on the phone, with the daughter on the phone, she could see in corners of the room, needles. The boy was on heroin. And trying to get the girl also to do the same. Alright? All the persuasion, all the logical talk fell to deaf ears. The girl said, I know what I'm doing. Mom, don't worry. I can take care of myself. I'm a big girl now. And they're so far away in the United States. She said, I just can't be flying over there every two weeks to see her. Right? So in front of the daughter, she's very calm, very cool, tried to be supportive, tried to be very encouraging, and telling her, you are the most valuable and precious thing in life. I taught you that as a little girl, and you must continue to hold that firmly in your heart. Right? This is when, like the father, you have to let go. 
And then you just have to trust. Jesus will be there for her, take care of her, and make sure that it all comes out right. There was a lot of tears in the back, in the background. Okay, she cried at every tea time with us. But in front of the daughter on the phone with the Skype, she was always cheerful, encouraging, and just very, very concerned. One and a half years later, she got a phone call. I have decided to drop the boyfriend. It took one and a half years of prayer and waiting and trusting the girl to do the right thing. And she did give up the boyfriend. Story doesn't end there. She then worked in a soup kitchen. In the United States, there's a soup kitchen where you, you, you serve the poor with, with uh, food. And after six months of that, she phoned the mother and said, I am going to consider entering the convent. <laughs> See how God works, okay, and how the spirit moves, right? So we have sometimes to let go and trust. And God will bring all things to His glory. Right? Okay. Good story, isn't it? Yeah. Real, okay? <laughs> These are all real stories. Okay. Now, I want you to look at the picture again. Because uh, there's something else. I didn't describe the picture to you. The, the, the father, the way he embraces the son. According to art critiques, one hand, is the gentle hand of the mother embracing the son. The other hand is the hand, the firm hand of the father. I'm taking you back and you jolly well listen to me later on. Okay, so the, the hands are different as they embrace the son. Okay, the gentle, so to be firm like the father and gentle like the mother. All right, and I think both mothers and fathers have to take on both that. Okay, the mother cannot be all firm and the mother cannot all be all gentle. So we have to take on both roles as parents, grandparents too. Now, the other one is the son looking on. His hands are folded. He's not happy. He's not happy the father is embracing the bad son, the one that has gone away and wrecked his life. And I think you know the story in the Bible. Okay, you kill a pecking calf for him. I have been here with you all the time. Um, Rembrandt paints this very well and he tries to bring up the message. Both the sons need healing. The first son is easier to heal actually. Okay, because he does something very naughty and so he's forgiven. The second son is all good, but he needs healing too. He needs to be reconnected with the Father. He needs to see himself in a different light. And that is harder to do actually. Alright, but he needs to be embraced by the Father too. And to be assured of the Father's love. So, so it's, it's just two different, um, different sons needing different things. Our children at home sometimes need different things. So you cannot have the same rule for all the children in the house. Okay? They need, they need different things. Um, and they, they need to reconnect with God. My, my, my goddaughter said something to me very recently. It was very interesting. She's about, she's in her in a mid-twenties and starting on the off in life. And she told me, perhaps it's good um, or better to be a Christian or a Catholic when you are older than to be a born Catholic. And I said, why? I said, you have received so much, you know, from God all your life, every blessing. She's a very intelligent girl, done very well in life. And has got a good job. And she says, yes, but you know what? Things are becoming, I'm beginning to take the Everything that I know for granted. Everything. Including going for communion. You know, there is no more wow factor. It is going through the motions. Very honest, right? Yeah. 
and I was about to open my mouth to say a whole lot of things that I remembered, oh, the importance of silence. <laughs> she would by now know, you know, the importance of receiving the Eucharist. The sacraments are there for us. Jesus is there for us through the sacraments in so many ways, right? I don't think I have to tell us, an intelligent girl. But spiritually, she has to reconnect with God. And she has to find that herself. So that's a different kind of way of looking at a prodigal son. Right? And she says, I have to find that connection myself. Not what mommy says, not what daddy says, not what auntie says. Lucky she did say, not what godma says. <laughs> So, okay, right? So I, I just said, right. And she said, I need time. And I said, yeah, that's for eternity. You take whatever time you need, and you need someone to talk to, you can have tea again. Yeah? So I, I think, you know, we are all prodigal sons. We all make mistakes every day in our lives. All right? I think um, we fall short a lot of the time. But we know that Jesus is there, God is there for us. And all we have to do is acknowledge the weakness and return to the Father. As easy as that. Okay? And so, how am I doing for time? Very bad, right? Over time like crazy. Okay, last one. Promise you, last slide. Okay. How many of you are parents here? Put up your hands. Can I have a look? Parents? Grandparents? On the way home, if you see curry puffs, buy some home. Celebrate being a family. Just don't forget to say um, a prayer before you have your curry puff. And start that habit formation. Alright? Thank you and God bless all of you.